Good morning. You're all very welcome to this morning's Signpost Series webinar, which is brought to you in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. My name is Tom O'Dwyer. Uh, I'm head of the Signpost programme with Chagask, um, and I'm your host for this morning's Signpost Series webinar. This morning we're joined um, online by Gavin Hunt, Farm Zero C Project Manager from Biorbic, uh, and he's joining us to tell us more about the Farm Zero C project. And I'm also joined online by my Chagas colleague, Eddie Burgess, uh, who's the Agricultural Catchment Specialist, uh, who will be helping me with questions later on on this uh, webinar. Good morning to you both, Gavin and Edward. Hey, Tom. Good morning. Good morning, Tom and everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Morning. Okay, to you first then, Gavin, uh, you're going to talk to us uh, later today about uh, the, the Farm Zero C project. But before we start, can you just tell, tell, tell us, uh, our listeners, a little bit about yourself and your role with the project? Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Tom, and delighted to be here. So thanks to the Chaga Sound Post team um, for having me on today. So yeah, my own role in the project is the Farm Zero C project manager. So I'm working with Biorwick and I'm based here full time on the farm in Shinnok. So from a day to day, managing each of the work packages, which I'll be speaking about on the project, looking at reporting, budgeting, stakeholder engagement, presentations, and then I suppose looking for future opportunities and funding um, for the Farm Zero C project as well. Um, just a small bit of background on myself, I would have graduated from animal and crop production in UCD a few years ago, would have spent a few years on the ground in working with farmers um, with Bandon Co-op as a dairy advisor, so I would have started in the role here um, with Biorbic and Farm Zero C about uh, actually nearly two years ago, so I think it was, I had just started in the role um, and I spoke in the signpost series back in October, so I think I had started in September, so um, I hope to have a, a lot more information and updates uh, today. Okay, excellent. Okay, and I've, I've 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 seen some of your slides beforehand, Gavin, and I I, I think that I'm looking forward to hearing you um, talk talk about the slides that that I've I've seen. So um, if I can ask you then to share your screen now, Gavin, and we'll begin the presentation. Um, and just before Gavin begins, I'd like to remind people that you can direct your questions uh, for Gavin through the Q and A function at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. The uh, chat function has been disabled, so use the Q&A function to submit your questions. And as I mentioned earlier, my Chagas colleague, Eddie Burgess, will be uh, reviewing those questions, as, as I will myself. Uh, and between the two of us, we, we put as many of your questions to Gavin uh, once Gavin finishes uh, his presentation. So over to you, Gavin. I uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. Fantastic. Thanks, Tom. C can you guys, can everybody see that? Uh, it it's displaying okay for me anyway. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Perfect. Yeah, again, thanks to the Chaga Signpost team for having me on this morning. So what I'm going to do is, is kind of give a brief overview and a bit of an update on the Farm Zero C um, project. So what, what is Farm Zero C? Farm Zero C is a collaboration between Biorick, Carberry and others to create an economically viable climate neutral dairy farm. So we're taking a holistic approach. We obviously have a big um, focus on reducing greenhouse gases, but also look at other key areas that agriculture is, is facing. So those key challenges such as water quality, air quality and biodiversity. So what we want Farm Zero C to be is a beacon for sustainable agriculture and provide a bright future for farmers and rural communities also. So just a small bit of a background about the project, just as a bit of a reminder. So who's actually involved in our collaboration agreement? Um, so this project is funded through SFI, through the Zero Emissions Challenge. Um, we have an industry partner who's leading the project here, um, which is Carberry. So Enda Buckley, Director of Sustainability of Carberry, is leading from that side. Um, Biorbic is a bioeconomy research centre who myself, um, who I work with, uh, Mary Kate, and also the leader on that side is, is Kevin O'Connor, who is the director. So we have five distinct work packages. We have work package one, who's looking at, it's Lawrence Lou in Chagas Moor Park, who's looking at um, animal emissions. Work package two is looking at biodiversity and natural capital accounting. So that's led by Jane Stout. Work package three is looking at life cycle analysis. So how we're quantifying our carbon footprint. That's led by Fanula Murphy in University College Dublin. Work package four is looking at renewables and grass biorefinery. So that's led by James Gaffey in MTU uh, in collaboration with Grassa, who are a Dutch grass biorefining company. And then work package five is looking at our social innovation blueprint, um, which is our, our business plan really. And um, that's also led by James Gaffey in uh, in MTU. So I'll I'll touch um, on the next slide in a bit more details on, on Shinnok Estates, but we're very lucky to be collaborating with the team here. So Kevin O'Hearn is the farm manager on the farm. Um, 
Gus O'Brien, um, Schnock Estates, and then uh, John McNamara, who's the, the, the Chagas advisor, who some of you may be familiar with. So I'm um, lucky to be collaborating with them, um, and we have a, a, a good team um, on board. So um, I suppose just before I start um, on, on to talking about Schnock Estates, um, in my previous slide, this kind of gives a, a rough um, idea of our partnerships and the collaboration agreement. So we're also working with a, a range of companies be it um, SMEs, startups, collaborating with other institutions and, and uh, projects as well. So I just think it's important to mention that these are the partners on a collaboration agreement, but we're collaborating with, with, with a lot more people uh, than, than, than on this um, slide. So a small bit um, about Schnock Estates Dairy Farm. So um, it's a commercial demo farm and about 250 cows um, and about 250 acres. So it was originally set up in 2011 as part of the Carberry Chagas Joint Programme in collaboration with um, the four West Cork co-ops, Bandon, Drina, Bayro and Lissavard. So the aim of the programme at the be beginning uh, was to demonstrate the design, set up an operation of a large scale dairy unit and a grass based system and to provide this uh, to provide information and the profitability and sustainability of this type of system. So I think it's fair to say over the last 11, 12 years, the farm has proved very, very successful um, and the, the focus has now pivoted as part of the farms you receive project to create this economically viable climate neutral dairy farm. We're lucky to be working with um, monitor farmers. So these are our 10 monitor farmers um, who are also carry suppliers and they're spread throughout the West, uh, Co West Cork region and West Cork co-ops. Um, so we'll work closely here with John McNamara, who's the Chagas advisor. So what we want these farmers to be is the early adopters of the technology used in the farm. So objectives similar to the project itself, reduce the carbon footprint, improve or maintain biodiversity and improve air and water quality also. So I think it's important to mention that some of these farmers are also um, Chagas uh, signpost um, farmers as well. So some of the key focus areas that I'll touch on today. So we're looking at life cycle assessment, animal emissions, breeding and animal health, soil and grassland, renewable energy, green biorefinery and anaerobic digestion, biodiversity and natural capital accounting, and then water and air quality. So I want to start with life cycle um, analysis or assessment. So this is basically how we are quantifying our, our carbon footprint. So I, some of this was maybe very, very familiar with um, quantifying the carbon footprint of ruminant systems or dairy systems. I just want to give a, a brief overview uh, about what we're trying to look at here. So when we're looking at the carbon footprint, the biggest contributor um, is, is methane. So that's a, that's a massive co contributor to the carbon footprint in any ruminant system, especially dairy. So enteric fermentation, that's over 50% of an average farm's carbon footprint. So for ruminants belching, there's also um, emissions from um, methane from stored slurry. Um, we're looking at nitrous oxide then. So nitrous oxide is an incredibly potent greenhouse gas. That's coming from animals dunging and urinating on pasture, spreading fertilizer. Um, and then we're looking at carbon dioxide. So we're looking at obviously burning fossil fuels in the farm, looking within the farm gate, but also outside the farm gate. So look at feed production, fertilizer production, um, et cetera. So the farm boundary, and I'm just going to get my um, pointer up here to demonstrate this. Um, so this, the system that we're looking at is um, a cradle to farm gate system. So we look at what happens within the farm boundary, how many cows, replacements, manure management types, milk production, slurry spreading. So all of those management practices, but also what's happening without, outside the farm gate. So we need to quantify the carbon footprint associated with these. So I always use the example of fertilizer. Fantastic. We, we want to reduce um, our use of fertilizer on the farm. That means it's going to be less carbon dioxide from burning the fossil fuels driving the tractor, less nitrous oxides from actually spreading it, but also less CO2 or carbon dioxide um, associated with actually producing that um, product as well. So the less inputs we've been through the farm gate, the, uh, the lower our carbon footprint is, is, is going to be. So for fertilizer, for example, we look at um, how much tons, tons of CO2 was produced, how did it get from the producer to the port, the port to the merchant, to the merchant to the farm. So that's all factored into um, a life cycle um, analysis. So some of your listeners will be familiar as well how this carbon footprint is displayed. So each um, gas has a, a, a different global warming potential. And this is all um, brought down to kgs of CO2 equivalent to, to one unit. And it's displayed per, per kg in fat and protein corrected milk. So just to touch on our results over the last um, few years. So our emissions have progressively reduced since 2018. We would have started at 0 0.84. So that's... Um, the first assessment we've done, it was it was quite a dry year um, and inputs were quite high. 
Um, so 0.84, so you, so you can see that the farm was quite efficient before we started. I think roughly the national figure at the moment is just above the, the 0.9 figure. So um, we've progressively reduced over the last number of years, and our most recent figure then is 0.66. So I'm going to touch on how we've achieved that 0.66 and how we're looking to the future to get that lower again. Just to give you a feel for it, and I have um, a slide in this later as well, measuring carbon sequestration is key in this life cycle analysis to achieve climate neutrality. So um, Alejandro Vergara, who, who um, is a PhD student in UCD, did some modelling in these. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us today, but um, just to give you a feel for it, 0 0.66, sort of far right here. This is our figure in 2022. If we take a low rate and a high rate, so it's um, the low rate is looking roughly about 300 um, kgs of carbon sequestered per hectare. The higher rate is looking at um, closer to a ton. You can see the impact that that's having in the carbon footprint. So we know this is happening on the farm here in the mineral soil in Chinook. It's just trying to prove what what is happening um, and, and how much. So um, I have a slide in this later that you can touch on it in a, in a bit more detail. Moving on to animal emissions. So as I mentioned, a big part of our carbon footprint here on the farm. So um, this work package is led by Lauren Shalou in Moorpark, Moor um, and we have a, a postdoc, Hazel Costigan, working in Moorpark in this with Chagas as well. So the objective is to find a methane reducing feed additive that can be implemented in a grass-based system. So um, some very um, well-known products are out there at the moment. Probably the most well-known is, is Treenop, now marketed as Bovair. So it's a, a, a DSM product. We have seaweed, um, red asparagopsis, room glass is a new product we're looking at, zelt masks. So some of these products, such as the Bovair and seaweed, they are working in a TMR indoor system. So the Bovair, somewhere between the 20 and 30% reduction in methane. Seaweed products could be up to 80, 90% reduction. So um, the key challenge in the project is is getting these to actually work in a grass-based system. So they're working in the TMR-based system. Indoors, how do we get them into a grass-based system? So that's the, the challenge above Moor Park. So we've done a, a few initial trials on these products. So um, with particular focus on the Bovair and Rumen Glass product. Um, results are, are positive. They are showing a reduction in methane, but they're not going to be the, the, the same levels of reduction in an indoor system when that, that diet can be controlled a bit more. So incorporation to the diet is obviously a key challenge. Cows come in in the, mor um, in the morning for milking in an Irish system. They go out in the evening uh, after milking. So predominantly on, on fresh grazed grass, how do we get it into the diet? Um, I know some positive work coming out of this as well. So what we have um, in, in Moor Park, and I know there's a lot of work going on here behind the scenes as well with um, Chagas and, and Vista Milk. There's a, a treatment group, which are obviously getting the supplement, the feed additive, and then there's a control group. So what they're seeing is that the National Inventory is currently overestimating the production of methane and Irish cows. So that's some positive um, results coming out of this as well, that the control groups um, are actually showing lower levels of methane than originally thought. So these are the machines that are used in, in Moor Park. Um, they're the green feed machines. So cows are out grazing and they're, they're, they, they come into these and that this is how the, the, the methane is, is captured in throughout the, throughout the day. Just a few pictures of the trials happening in Moor Park. So this is the green feed again uh, and some of the products been fed um, after milking um, in the morning and, and evening. We're working quite closely with um, a startup out of NUIG. So this is led by Vincent O'Flaherty and Rory Freel in uh, NUIG in, in Glassport Bio. So when we're looking at methane from stored slurry and an average dairy farm, it could be somewhere in the region of seven to eight percent um, of their carbon footprint. So it's a, it's a key focus area. So um, Glassport Bio have a methane reducing slurry additive that has been proven at lab scale. We've scaled it up to IBC um, on the farm here. We're hoping to publish a paper on this as well. Uh, and then we've, we've actually taken a step further and used it in the main cow tank here in, in Schnock uh, over the winter of 2021-2022. Uh, and we've used that again um, on the previous winter. So we're seeing those results um, being scaled up from lab scale up to a commercial demo farm um, here in Schnock. So just to give you a feel for um, what kind of reductions we've seen. So our red line here is the control group or the control um, IBC tanks. Um, so what we've seen is um, this is the cumulative biogas uh, production. The green line then is the glass per bio treatment. And what we've seen is this gray line here. We've roughly seen a 75 to 80% reduction in methane from stored slurry. The company thinks that we could potentially get that higher if we dose a bit more regularly. So it's some very, very positive results coming out of this um, out of this work. 
So just to cover um, energy use in renewables, it's when we look at the carbon footprint, it's not a, a, a major uh, contributor, but it's still an area we need to focus on. I think at the average dairy farm, it's roughly about 4%. So still an area that we need to focus on um, and improve as much as possible. So our objectives were to reduce reliance on fossil fuels, reduce the cost of energy on farm, and then reduce um, the, the, the carbon footprint. Our first step was to actually reduce our overall energy demand before looking at renewables. So reduce what we're using before looking at renewables and get a, a, a better bang for our, our buck or better impact when we actually looked at the renewables then. So um, we installed more energy efficient equipment. Some of this equipment was um, in place already, such as um, variable speed drives in the vacuum and mill pump. Um, we looked at heat recovery from the compressors. We looked at new efficient compressors and um, better ways to heat the water, better ways to cool the milk. Um, um, and then looked at the renewables. So there was a wind turbine installed in the farm since 2011. And then we installed um, solar panels, so solar PV panels in the roof and the milking parlor. So it's east-west configuration. And we coupled that with, with, with battery storage. So um, very, very positive results. And I'm, I'm just going to touch on that in the next slide as well. But just to give you a feel for an overall energy demand on, on, on a dairy farm. So there's a, a lot happening on this graph, but I'm just going to use my pointer here. So um, our blue line is the consumption. So how much energy we're consuming on the farm. So this is from our system um, a few days ago on the, the 13th of June. So you can see milking starts just after six o'clock and there's a big peak. Obviously the parlor is running, needs to cool the milk, et cetera. Um, and then it tapers off in the middle of the day and then there's a peak in the evening um, as well. So solar will obviously have the most effect um, in the middle of the day. So we've used the battery storage to capture this um, excess energy and can use the peak times. So you can see here um, from your green line that the battery is drained in the morning milking and you can see this excess um, electricity produced that's charging our battery and as soon as you come to um, our evening milking that's drained and um, then and then charged again our green line charged over the um, over the evening when there's, when there's not that energy demand so just to give you a feel um for some of the the figures that we've seen um we installed this um last july with the solar panels on its own um so the solar panels were there on its own for maybe a month and a half and then we installed the uh, the battery um storage on top of that so it's nearly being in 12 months but just to give you a feel um this is may obviously going to be a fantastic month may and june for for solar but just to give you a the, show the impact here the self sufficiency is 53 percent. so we've seen nearly a 50 percent reduction in the energy bills and energy usage from the solar and battery storage at the moment our wind turbine is actually out of action like anything with moving parts needs to be refurbished and repaired so we're hoping that we can maybe even push this and we're hoping that the two technologies can complement each other if the sun isn't shining we'd be hoping that the wind is is, is going to be blowing um and that can be incorporated into the battery storage um uh, as well Look at the native concentrate. So this is um, a part of our, our carbon footprint and Alejandro has gone into this in a bit more detail um, and he's gone into the granularity of, of what actually makes up um, our, our concentrate that we feed. So there's significantly less carbon associated with Irish cereals versus imported ingredients. Um, so a native ration is approximately, depending on what you're looking at, could have a 40 to 50 percent lower carbon footprint versus um, imported. So higher protein normally means higher emissions. So it's the, it's the big one we're looking at is um, importation of soya. Um, we know as a country we're reliant and dependent on, on bringing um, some, some feed into the country. So um, if we can't look at Irish, if Irish ingredients aren't available, what we're looking at is EU, by, uh, EU products such as beef, pulp, rapeseed, etc. So to give a feel for it, an average year in Schnock, if we, if we were to do with the conventional, what we were using the last number of years um, before the project started to the, to the native or EU, we could see approximately a 2 to 3% reduction in, in, in emissions. And that's that's what the associated um, created the farm gate with the, with the production of those um, externalities. So um, just moving on to grassland. So it's a key part of the project. And I think it's just um, important to mention here from the outset that um, the farm have been looking at this for a few years. And this has really been driven on by the farm manager, uh, Kevin Hearn. On a typical year, um, and you can see from the figures here, in 2018, 2018 2019, the farm would have been spreading 250 kgs of, of chemical nitrogen. That's been reduced significantly in 2022 to 147 kgs of chemical nitrogen. So some massive progress been made there. How has the farm achieved that? Multi-species wards, roughly about 11% of the grazing platform is sown on the multi-species wards. That's actually been increased. I must update that figure because um, over the last month, there's been some um, more uh, being receded. 
white clover then is a big part of um, the project, incorporating into the grazing platform through over sowing and also full receding. And then red clover has been incorporated into the silage ground. Some potential um, areas we can look at in the future is potentially biostimulants to further reduce nitrogen usage and increase um, nitrogen use efficiency. Protected urea, we're all very, very aware of um, the benefit of protected urea has a significantly lower nitrous oxide emissions compared to, to can-based products. So like most farms would have dipped their toes in the water in 2019 with a small bit of protected urea. And we've seen that we've increased that significantly in 2022. So nearly 100% of the inputs were um, protected urea. That small 3% was a small bit of 10, 10, 20 um, can-based products just used um, at, at receding. The benefits, protected urea, there's no imp impact on grass yield. Um, and we're looking at a benefit from greenhouse gas and also ammonia emissions. Um, and it's also lower per cost of, or per unit or per um, kg of nitrogen compared to, to, to can. So it's a, it's a win-win for the farmer and the environment. Just touching on carbon sequestration as well. So um, soil carbon sequestration moves, what is it? It removes, it's the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it in soils and woody biomass. So we want to measure this in Schnock and, and, and try to prove what and measure and verify what, what the farm is potentially sequestering. So how are we doing that? We're taking soil samples to 30 centimetres to monitor changes in um, organic carbon and total carbon. Um, an AD covariance tower has been installed in the farm as well in collaboration with NASCO and the Chagas team. So James has been down in the farm and this uh, was installed um, last November. Um, and we want to use that data um, to calculate how much carbon has been stored in, in, in the grassland. So look at then uh, practices that increase carbon sequestration, potentially multi-species spores, extending, increasing hedgerows, improving soil fertility, looking at organic fertilizer, and then trying to mitigate against the, the or reduce the practices that inhibit carbon sequestration, soil compaction, draining of wetlands, um, and deep tillage or deep, deep, deep cultivations. So this is just a, a technology that I want to touch on, um, and it's it's an important part of the project. Um, so James Gaffey is is the lead in this, and um, has been looking at grass biorefinery in in this country for a number of years. So it's quite a new technology here. It's probably at a lower stage of development than some of the other technologies I'm I'm going to be talking about. But it's it's more of an established um, technology in the likes of Denmark. They actually have a commercial unit up and running in Holland. We feel as a project that this could potentially complement AD and also provide opportunities for farmers in the in the bioeconomy. So, what is grass biofinery? Um, it, it it was explained to me when I started on the project, and I think it's a good analogy. It's 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 similar to putting milk into a milk processor. You are valorizing grass. So you put grass, um, and I get my pointer into into this grass biorefinery. You're getting a few fractions out of this. You're getting a press cake, which is the which basically looks like it's silage, looking like long cuttings here. That can be baled and then fed as a ruminant feed. So we've done some trials in this um, and we, we've seen very little difference between silage and, and the press cake. We're getting a, a juice fraction out of this as well. So the two areas that we're really focusing on here are the protein concentrate and in the nutrient um, rich way. So the protein concentrate can actually be dried and it um, can be up to 50% crude protein and used as um, an alternative to soya um, production. So we've done two trials to date on this, a 25% replacement of soy in the diet and a 50% of replacement of soy in the diet in, in pig diets. And we've seen no negative um, impacts on production. So very, very positive. This um, technology can potentially um, replace soya. So as we know, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're, we're reliant on importing protein into the country. So we're very, very good at grass. Can we actually potentially use this technology um, to, to display some of those emissions coming in from, 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 from soya? This also has a benefit from the AD industry. So we're, we're thinking that um, this nutrient-rich way has a high biogas potential. So this can also be fed into an AD unit. So um, we feel as a project, it could potentially have that, it could complement um, AD. You still have, instead of just putting grass into a biogas, you can actually extract that valuable protein. You can still have your nutrient rich way and still have some, some feed for, for ruminants. So it's quite an interesting technology. Um, and this unit actually behind us was out on the farm um, in Schnock back in 2019 as part of a separate um, uh, grass biorefinery project with, with um, MTU and um, Carberry. So just some photos um, of the grass biorefinery. So um, this is the unit in, in Holland. Um, and here, here are some of the, this is the product here, the grass protein concentrate, um, which, was, which, which was milled in Barry Row and fed to local um, pig, 
um, sent to a local pig farmer where it was fed. And you can see here, the photo isn't fantastic, but this is the this is the soya-based product, kind of a, a yellowy tinge off it. And then this is the grass protein, so it's a slight, slightly green um, tinge off it as well. So next steps to scale this technology, we're very lucky to have received 3 million euro funding from the Department of Agriculture. So the next steps is, is to, to build a pilot um, AD and grass biofriendly on the farm here in, in Chinook. So moving on to biodiversity, it's a key part of our project here. Um, we can't just focus on greenhouse gases. We need to look at, at a biodiversity as well. Um, and it's very, very important. So from a, a national level, um, there's been a... a a biodiversity crisis um, declared. We're looking at the EU farm to fork strategy as well, and there's a big, big focus on biodiversity. So our goal here on the project is to have 10% of the total farm area under high quality biodiverse cover. So um, what does that mean? It, it basically means anything that's not um, buildings, productive grassland, roadways, um, so your forests, scrubland, hedges, um, et cetera. And I get into a bit more detail of, of, of how we're trying to achieve that, that 10%. So really important for the farm, provides ecosystem services, shelter for livestock, protects water quality, prevents flood and soil erosion, carbon storage and then pollination. So really important for the environment as well, it provides food and shelter for a range of wildlife and then provides habit, uh, habitat connectivity um, for wildlife um, movement. So a small bit about the biodiversity in Chinook, um, I get my point to here. So natural habitat, so we're looking at, at that, that figure, natural habitat percentage, um, trying to get to that 10% target. So in 2020, we would have started at 7.54%. And what we've done is improved that um, by 1.1%. So our most recent figure in 2022 is 8.64%. So what have you done to achieve that? Extended um, hedgerow habitats by moving fences, created wetland habitats, including ponds, looked at new hedgerows, tree lines, scrub habitats, um, and I can show you a few pictures in the next few slides of, 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 um, of those measures. So we need to get to 10%. What we have at the moment is some land under Sitka. So Keen White, our biodiversity um, expert and ecologist in the project, um, does not classify Sitka as high quality biodiverse habitat. So if, if we were to include that, we'd be over the 10%. But from a biodiversity point of view, we're not including this because we feel it, it doesn't have that um, value to, to biodiversity. To give you a feel for what habitats are on the farm, um, majority are uh, woodland, hedgerows, and some semi-natural grassland is, is the main bulk, but looking at vegetative banks um, and ditches and other um, habitats um, also. So this gives you a kind of a feel um, for what I've, I've just touched on. So that the Sitka, this is a, a small pocket of Sitka at the bottom of the farm, which we're not counting as biodiverse habitat. So that's an option that we're potentially assessing at the moment is to replace that with um with a, a native um forestry. This is the Sitka tree lane we're we're talking about as well. Um, we're not counting this towards our biodiversity targets as well, but we don't want to get rid of this um at at the moment because this has other ecosystem benefits as well. Provide shelter for livestock. Um, it's it and it's it's quite a windy farm here um as as well. So there's a lot of benefit to having that there. So to get to that 10%, can we look at it potentially expanding some of those other um, practices we've done as well, including new hedgerows, semi-natural grasslands to get to that 10% um, target? What we've done in the project as well is identify areas that have the lowest impact on production. So that was the first thing that Keen went and from a practical point of view. So for example, um, the picture here on the left, we went to a, a, a new native hedgerow. So there's a, a range of biodiverse species in here. Um, Black thorn, white thorn, gilder rose, holly, wild privet. So I think there's up to 12. This was actually just a, a lawn area that was cut. So while it didn't have an impact on productivity, that's what we wanted to focus on. This wetland habitat here was couldn't really get into the shoulders of the year. Cows were potentially poaching it. So what we did was fenced around it and left it back into a wetland habitat and created a pond. Um, and some of the other simple stuff is, is management practices, leaving hedgerows go, um, trying to expand the width of them. Um, and just simple management practices on, on the farm as well. So we need to expand those further to get to our, our, our 10%. What Keen or Postdoc is trying to do as well is scale habitat mapping on farms. So what he's trying to do is look at um, look at satellite um, imagery, look at light spectrums, texture, modeling, and then creating a habitat map. So in the future, what Keen wants to do is you, you will provide a farm outline and this will be done automatically and generating um, a satellite-based habitat mapping um, system. 
So looking at natural capital accounting, um, this is one of the, the key focus areas of work package too. Um, so Jane Stout um, is leading this work package and Fabio is one of our postdocs working in this. So it, natural capital accounting measures and values assets where they be beneficial to the economy and society. So these assets include biodiversity, carbon storage, soil health, water quality, flood mitigation, and cultural and heritage value. And we want natural capital to help inform policy and develop um, incentives that would be beneficial to the farmer and, and nature. So, for example, on a, on a biodiversity, I always use the example of hedgerows for really, really important for biodiversity, but they also provide a lot of other ecosystem um, services as well. They store carbon, they prevent runoff. Um, there's a lot of um, aesthetic value if you drive through the countryside hedgerows are renowned um for um in, in this country so a lot of other values it's and it's it's how to how how to quantify that um and then potentially incentivize farmers um to, to expand these um further so looking at water quality so water quality is a key focus here in the and the project as well what we want to do is our objective is, is to demonstrate a best practice or good practice and then potentially trying to monitor monitor these changes over time so um, what have we done in Schnock? Um, so we're using low emission slurry sp spreading technology. We've moved fences to increase the buffers. We're following a strict nutrient management plan um, and done soil sampling. We're trying to spread slurry in spring or summer using 100% protected urea, ensuring adequate slurry storage capacity, considering weather forecast before um, and after slurry application, as well as chemical fertilizer. So looking at soil temperature, rainfall, et cetera, and then good farmyard um, management practices as well. So preventing um, runoff um, from the yard, um, et cetera. So we're working very closely with um, the, the ASAP team here in, in Carberry. So it's a, it's a big, big focus. Um, and we're, we're working close with those advisors uh, and they've done some assessments on the farm um, and we've, we've implemented those, th those changes. What we're trying to do as well is look at um, trying to measure water quality actually on the farm here in Schnock as well. So we're using ceramic cups that have been installed last year um, and tree spore types, look at multi-species, perennial rye grass and clover, and then perennial rye grass only. So these ceramic cups are measuring um, groundwater to a depth of roughly 90 centimetres to one metre. Um, they're installed in a nest, so we have three nests in each field and have a central sampling point, and then we have cups then um, five metres apart in, in, in different directions. So just to give you a feel, um, these are some pictures our, our farm research technician Mary Kate had took. So um, it's monitoring water quality under the surface, but all you see is, is this is um, looks like a small manhole cover, and those, those are sampled on a weekly basis when rainfall is high, and then on a fortnightly basis um, if, if rainfall is, 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 is lacking. I have a few slides left, so just to um, touch on our social innovation blueprint. So this is a um, work package led by James Gaffey, and we have a, a postdoc and MTU working in this, Teresa. So it's basically how do we, there's a lot happening on the project, a lot of different technologies. How do we actually bring this um, and show potential stakeholders, farmers, people in the industry what, what's actually happening? So not trying to reinvent the wheel either. There's some fantastic um videos, documents out there from the likes of Chagas, UCD as well. So trying to incorporate them as well. Simple videos, um, for example, um, look at methane, look at clover. If a farmer wants to implement clover, there's a short video. Um, there's some additional information of where he can actually find information to, to, to try and um, increase this on his farm. What's the economic benefit? What's the environmental benefit? Um, and then it's this is going to be an open access website and platform, and then it's creating a, a business plan as well. So look at the national farm. What happens if we look at all of these um, incentives? What's the cost? How is it going to affect the economic performance? Um, where is carbon farming going forward? How can that potentially come into the equation? Um, and looking at market analysis um, as well for, for climate neutral products. Before I finish up, I have maybe three or four slides left. Um, I think it's just uh, important to mention uh, this project. So. Um, Farm Zero C isn't directly involved in this project, but Schnock Estates is where the, where the project is um, predominantly based. So um, it's the Tipperary uh, Calf to Beef project, which is a joint project between Chagas, Schnock Estates and, and Dawn Meats. So it's um, very topical in terms of the dairy calf to beef, um, in terms of that sustainability. So the objectives of the project are to raise awareness of the dairy beef production as a mainstream enterprise, which can make a viable contribution to farm, family farm income, set financial and technical benchmarks for an efficient dairy beef farm, demonstrate impact in technical innovation and farm profitability, and demonstrate best practice in an environmental parameters while operating at a profitable business. So how is the farm involved here? 
So Schnock Estates uses sex semen AI straws to produce the dairy replacement and then uses high beef merit AI bulls um, for the rest of the calves. So there's no stock bulls or teaser bulls um, here on the farm anymore. Um, selects normal gestation, easy calf and beef AI bulls with high beef merit from the dairy beef index. And then all surplus star, all so, surplus calves are then sold into the beef farm um, above in, in Tipperary. And then the price is based on the calf beef merit, so the CBV. Um, and then three other farms in the West Cork region have a, a similar um, contract. So uh, this is one of my, my last slides. Um, so stakeholder engagement is a key part of the Farm Zero Seed project. I strongly believe that Irish dairy has a good story to tell. So we are in a, a good starting position, but we also need to recognise that we need to improve and adopt new practices and, and technology. So we're very, very eager to um, meet new people, share ideas. So um, we have a lot of people through the farm gate here on the project, and then obviously attending events like today um, and other members of the project speaking on behalf um, of, of, our, um, of, of our objectives. So um, just to give you a flavour for who comes through the farm gate here. So we have primary school students, secondary, third level, policymakers, politicians, farmers, discussion groups, industries, customers of Irish dairy. So very, very broad um, um, group of people um, come through the farm gate here. So it's, it's a key part of the project. Um, and just a quick update as well in the farms you receive building. So since I last spoke in the project, um, we had the use of the, the Carberry farms you receive building now. So it's a fantastic space, which allows us to facilitate all of these groups um, and also facilitate, facilitate the, the, the project team. So it's a fantastic space to have. And that's where I'm uh, presenting from um, here today. Thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, very interesting presentation. There's a, a number of questions in the submitted through Q&A, and I know um, I've been keeping an eye on them, and my colleague Eddie has as well. Um, just to remind our listeners that if you if you have any particular question for Gavin, uh, you can now enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and Eddie and I will, will do our best to, to, to place your questions to Gavin. Um, I'm just going to pick up. It's, it's actually a, a, a a question that I was kind of wondering about myself as well, and it, it, it appears in the chat. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to kick off with that one and then I'm going to hand over to Eddie. And it's a question relating to your biodiversity target. Um, Jane in the chat just mentions that the target for biodiversity at 10% seems quite low. I, I don't know, but that's what Jane says. Um, and is there any long term aim to go further than the 10%? And I, my, my, my version of that question was, I suppose it's often perceived that dairy farmers, you know, might have a, a relatively low level of biodiversity, but you've shown on your farm that on the, on the Shinnok Estates farm um, in Bandon that there's almost 9% um, biodiversity. So would you just comment on both those, please? Yeah, certainly, Tom. So um, the 10% the target, so where that 10% target came from, I suppose, um, at the beginning of the project, we sat down with uh, Jane Stout in Trinity College Dublin and the ecologist, and we, we set that target at 10%. And where, where it predominantly came from was the EU Farm to Fork strategy, who set that 10% target. So for us, I think 10% would be a fantastic figure. That's not to say in a few years down the line that that could be potentially increased again. But for now, I think 10% would be a phenomenal target to, to, to get to. Um, and in terms of um, Irish dairy farms, so I, I think, Tom, and you might correct me that the, the average... Um, is around from from previous studies done by Chagas is around that seven or eight percent. Um, mm. so, um, for for Shinnok to get the ten percent, I think it would be a fantastic new new story. Um, and yeah, but I, I suppose my 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 kind of thinking on that or thoughts on that were you know were you surprised when you measured Shinnok and you found that you were at just about eight percent and you were able to increase it by one percent with some simple measures? You know, was that a surprise to you or because was because dairy farms are perceived as very intensive, you know, with, with not a lot of space for nature. So, yeah. I think I, I was definitely surprised at the beginning. And I think at fairness to Keen Wife, the ecologist, um, it was very, very simple measures. And he looked at trying not to affect production as, as, as possible. Um, Try not to affect production um, if possible. So, for example, like there was a, a grassland area that was cut in the farm. So that was put back into um, a hedgerow there was a wetland area that cows couldn't really graze they weren't really getting um, that much productivity out of it so i was surprised at the start but in, in fairness to keen white um i think those those um simple practices and the farm took them on and they were able to identify them i think was 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 fantastic okay um eddie i'll hand over to you yeah. for thanks questions. tom 
Yeah, uh, well done, Gavin. And I, th I think that the, the broadness of everything that you're doing in Farm Zero C there is coming through in the questions, and there's a huge, a huge spread in the topics that are being asked. That so I'm just going to stick. There's a couple more in biodiversity, and we'll try and stick with them, and then move on to the others. One is more a comment. Uh, they're saying Sitka spruce does have a good element of biodiversity, especially in small stands where thin sites, um, where sites are thinned and the forest floor is receiving sunlight. And their question, should it not be included as part of the biodiverse area? So, so I think that that's just a comment. Um, and I suppose, given that you, you've, you've shown the improvements that have taken place in biodiversity since the project started, have you noticed any practical changes in what you see biodiversity, like wildlife and uh, flora and fauna on the farm uh, over the years that, that the improvements have taken place? Yeah, so, so uh, thanks, Eddie. Just, just to start with the cyclic piece, I suppose, um, that, that's probably a, a debate we've had internally within the project as well. And again, sat down with the with the experts, with, with Jane and Keen. Um, on a single, and I, I would make that debate at times as well, on, a, on a, those single tree lines that I highlight on the, on the farm, they provide a lot of ecosystem services as well. There is potentially um, some biodiverse, um, biodiversity benefits from them. So I think um, in, in some methodologies, they actually count them as 15%. So if you have one hectare, it's counting 15% of that as the natural um, or biodiverse area. The plantations or that those pockets of Sitka, um, I must say, I suppose, having the discussion internally with the project and then actually walking down into those Sitka plantations um, into those pockets as soon as you walk into them you can see and they've been described as a biodiversity dead zone that there is very very little in, inside there and the ones definitely um, on, on the farm so from a project point of view sat down with, with, with Jane and Keen um, and the ecologists in Trinity and um, they were happy not to classify that as uh, as biodiverse area um, I think we could, Eddie, and say, fantastic, we're over 10%, but I, I don't think that would be a fair assessment of, of what's happening. Um, and then on the improvements, so we, we have we have seen some visible improvements as well. Um, some of these things can be difficult to, to measure, um, like plant species, pollinators, but we've actually done studies to what habitat it was in before, and then what, what is it now, and comparing pollinators, insects, plant species, and we've seen a, a massive difference, but even visibly. So... For example, um, Mary Kate, who's our farm research technician working on the farm here, she's out in the farm a lot more than me. She would say that she sees there's mallard ducks coming in, there's more frog spawn. You can actually visibly see, even walking up through the farm, we have visitors on the native hedge or the native hedgerow. There's more birds sitting on the fence next to it, going into the habitat. So, um, we've measured it uh, with with our PhD master students, and we're actually visibly seeing some increase in the biodiversity as well. So, I think it's fantastic. Good, good. You know, that makes it a nicer place to 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 work, happier place to, to, to be in. It's a nice place uh, to go for a walk at lunch, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and, and again, I suppose building on on the question about it, is the 10% enough? Um and coming back to the broad aspect of everything that you're coming with, given the gains and the improvements that you've measured over the years with all the measures. Do, do you envisage, and I know you have to set a baseline and targets, like you, like you mentioned of the 10% with Jane Stout, but do, do you imagine a situation where positive the positive experiences that you're seeing at the moment will encourage you to increase the targets and the aims, such as even using less fertilizer in the future, uh, going beyond the current targets that were set? Sorry, in relation to the biodiversity targets, in the, the, or no, abroad, a, abroad across everything, um, and, and I suppose you you could pick the easier ones first. But 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 like you, you you've shown massive improvements there. I'm I'm just like like the the CO two equivalent for uh, milk has has come from 0.84 down to 0.66. Your chemical nitrogen has has gone from 250 to under 150. Do you see those? targets across the broad and i'm not saying you have to stick to those specific ones but just in general abroad across the whole farm do you see that the targets that you set out initially may be um more than achieved and do you see to yourselves maybe expanding on those or, or going further and, and and increasing the targets as as you progress because things are going well Potentially, and it, I suppose it depends on the, the measure you're looking at. So, for for example, obviously we'd like to push this as as much as possible, um, and we're lucky to be working with the progressive team here in the farm. But just just take example the chemical nitrogen. It would be very very difficult for us to get that down 
below that that one fifty target. Um, if we're trying to still um achieve the dream out of production on the farm, so it's something we've discussed, and it, it's difficult. If there's new measures coming on and there's new technologies being adopted, one hundred percent will definitely try push that. But cu- currently, on the chemical nitrogen, it, it, it's difficult to kind of push that, um, push that a, a bit yeah. further. Um, s- similar with the um with the biodiversity targets, um. Difficult as was, we want to achieve that ten percent target first before actually trying to go yeah. a step further. But um, I think I think ten percent target is like if you take that there's two hundred and fifty acres on the farm here, um, obviously some buildings and etc. as well. But you'd have ten percent, which is twenty five acres of the whole farm would be in. So I think that's a that's that's quite a substantial amount. Um, and it, it's trying to it's trying to look at the profitability, and that needs to be that needs to be factored in here as well. The profitability. Um, of the system, um, constrained the land use as well. We know what's coming down the line in terms of um, nitrates, derogation, etc. So, um, but I think ten percent is what we're trying to stick to at the moment. But who knows? In a couple of years, may, maybe there'll be a push to get more. But I think ten percent would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm going to change topic a little bit now on the questions coming in on the feed additives on methane. Um, uh, one really was a question with, with the introduction of new feed, and I'm, I'm assuming they said new feed, I'm assuming they're talking about feed additives, and they're cons- is there not a concern that will impact on the quality of products that are being produced? Um, we, we, I'm just saying that we already know that Irish meat has good quality, but introduce new fed, feed additives, may, may it, uh, are, you, are you worried that it could not impact negatively in, into the future? And, and I'm just going to give a second question there in, in a similar area. Uh, do you think that synthetic three NOP is really a choice for a, uh, a sustainable direct methane reduction? I suppose really, can you expand a little bit on 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 the work you've done on methane additives? And that? Yeah, and I suppose those those two points probably come into the same um the, the, the same kind of answer, I suppose. Um, so, so the impact of feed additives, uh, n- number one, what, when we're feeding these feed additives, we want to look at the impact of animal health. These, if we if we want to find a successful one, they have to have no impact on animal health and no impact on milk production. Um, and all of these products as well, we need to look at, is there any potential um, effect on, on the products coming out of them? So um, be it milk, cheese, butter, um, all of those products, what are, is there any um, potential risks there? So all of that has to, if you want to get a successful feed out of working, you have to go through all of those steps. So, um, and it's very, very important and rigorous testing has to go into um, into them. For the, the tree knot or bovair product, so that has gone through that rigorous testing. So that has uh, gone through European Food Safety Authority um, approval. So that is actually commercially available and can be bought in, in the EU um, as of now. And um, they're happy that it doesn't have any impact on um on, on the aspects that I, I just um, mentioned there. Yeah. Could, could, could I come in with a couple of questions, Eddie? I'm, I'm just looking at the questions. There's, there's a few on the, on the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions as well. Um, so a first one maybe from Neve, who asks, um, you've presented a very positive story in terms of the reduction in, in the carbon footprint. Um, can you provide us with uh, any information on whether total farm emissions uh, reduced in, in by the same amount or in, in a similar direction, uh, Gavin. Yeah, so so Tom, we we've seen um, a, a significant reduction in uh, total emissions as well. I don't have those slides up in front of me at the moment, um, but there has been a significant reduction as well. Um, there was a slight increase in in even though the herd size increased slightly by maybe 20, 30 cows, we've still seen a, a reduction. So from twenty eighteen to twenty twenty, there was a slight increase in cow numbers, but we've still seen a significant reduction. I don't have that figure off the top of my head, but. Um, but yeah, okay, we and, have seen a, a, a reduction in the total farm emissions as well. Okay, and um, my my colleague Pierce then uh, from Chagas uh, <coughs> asks if you could just very briefly outline, and I, I, I think you did it probably through your presentation, but just in summary form, what were the main steps that drove that reduction in carbon footprint? Just, just I, to recap, I, I, I probably described them as the low-hanging fruit, Tom, that you, you would also be prefer, prefer our promoting the mac curve and and, and the same input so um reducing inputs the less we bring in through the farm gate the lower our carbon footprint is going to be so feeding less concentrate that's a key key piece there um so the farm is always targeting five or six hundred kgs of concentrate over the last if we have a drought period of course we have we have to feed um a, a bit mm-hmm. more so reducing inputs 
feed and fertilizer, that's a big impact on the carbon footprint. Looking at the, the composition of the concentrate, trying to reduce, looking at um, low carbon footprint products, protected urea has had a massive benefit. I think the figure, if, if um, an average farm went from 100% can to 100% protected urea, it's a 7 to 8% reduction in the carbon footprint. So that has had a major impact as well. Looking at renewable energy, looking at the slurry additives as well going forward. But um, those are those are the big ones. It's it's the low hanging fruit, the clover reduction of um, inputs um, and Tom are the main ones. And obviously look, the farm has a big, big focus on uh, EBI. Their herd would be in the top 5% easy in terms of the EBI breeding cows that are more efficient, healthier, and produce last longer in the herd mm. and produce better quality milk. Mm. Yeah, no, all, all makes per perfect sense. Um, and I suppose the one that really struck me and, and I took note of as you're, as you're going through your presentation was the, the protected urea. And I suppose within Chagas, we view the adoption of protected urea as the low hanging fruit for most farmers or, you know, should be, should be one of the first steps for most farmers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Over four to five years, you've gone to a situation where practically 100% of your nitrogen is spread as protected urea. Now, many, many farmers would, and, and in, including some of my own advisory colleagues would say, that's just not possible. You know, there's, there's times of the year where you have to get out P and K. Um, so how, how are you achieving that practically 100% protected urea? So th this is something we looked at at the start of the project as well, and we wanted to try to maximize the, 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 the use of protected urea. So um, as you know, it, it's, it's the, the big issue is, is P. We uh, trying to get P in our product with the urease inhibitor. So um, the farm is quite fertile, pH is quite good, um, indexes are quite good, so there's not a massive um, requirement for P, but um, maximizing slurry, incorporating those um, K and S in with the nitrogen protected urea and then using a small bit of, um, if, if possible, straight P. So um, super P, I uh, can't think of the name of the other product, but using the, that's that's the big issue, as you know, Tom, it's yeah. it's trying to get P in, but it's using maximizing slurry and using the best benefit from that. And if we do require a small bit of additional P, that's spread with um, okay. uh, super P. But even at times of the year, if, um, for example, clover swords that might not be getting um, nitrogen, um, you could go with something like 0730 or a product with, with, with zero, mm -hmm. zero in. Yeah. I, I guess the, the point for me is, I suppose, as, as a farm, you're, you're prepared to do that. You know, it, it, it does take, it's, it's a decision, it's a choice. Um, and, and you've made that choice and now you're able to show us the results. Yeah. yeah and, and in fairness to Kevin Hearn, the farm manager, he's the person um, that's on the ground doing this. So um, he's happy to do it and he's found it, it's, it's, it's practical. And that's one of the very exciting things about the project for me, that if somebody else comes out here, another farmer, be it another industry, whoever, they can see it working in a commercial demonstration farm that all feeds mm. into the economics, into the, into the practicality uh, of it as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll hand back to Eddie then. Have you maybe two or three maybe final questions, Eddie? We're we're coming towards half ten. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm smiling because actually I got thrown out and I'm back in again there for a second. So oh. the time, the timing of your questions was appropriate, and I apologise if if I'm over if I'm overlapping something that that was already asked. Uh, move on. Um, but there's a, a couple of questions coming in on the physical output of the farm and how that has changed over time. Have your cow numbers changed? How has profit number happened? How has output per cow performed while uh, while all these benefits for the environment have been taking place? So, so in terms of there was a slight increase um, in cow numbers um, since since 2018. Um, so just just to note that. But in terms of profitability, like. The, the farm has had no negative impact on production or, or profitability. So in terms of um, still looking at the key drivers of profitability in a dairy farm, maximizing graze grass in the diet, um, tight um, calving um, in the spring or somewhere over around that 90% six week calving rate. So in terms of the profitability figures, they haven't had any significant impact at all at all. Um, so the farm in fairness would be in the top easy 10%. So, Achieving that, I think the, the Chagas target time two and a half thousand euro per um per hectare, they would be ex exceeding that or, or achieving that, and and in most years, and be it a good milk price here, bad milk price here, they've they've proven that a low input grass based system is is, is sustainable. A couple of of specific questions, maybe. Um, how do you see the gas bio -refin refinery and anaerobic digester scaling up across the region and and across the dairy sector in general? 
do you think will it be in centralized large units or a greater number of smaller units spread out all over the country? That's that's a good um, question, Eddie. I, I don't know the answer um, to that. I suppose that's what we want to look at as part of that research. So I would say it's a lower TRL, lower stage of development. So it, those are some of the key questions that we'd we'd like to answer um, as we progress this. I, I would think, um, in my own opinion, and I suppose we, we need to look at the, the economics um, and, and practicality, I would see it as potentially a, a cooperative system maybe going forward that um, you're drawing grass in um, into this and it could be you might be taken back, digested, back press cake, um, etc. But I think from from a scale point of view, I would think it would have to be a, um, a, a cooperation, be it AD or grass boy refinery. We know the impacts or the, the, the shortage of labour in the dairy industry. I don't think asking a farmer to, and that's what we've, that's what previous studies would, would have shown as well with the grass boy refinery. We had a mobile unit out in farms. It was um, just out on, on one farm. I think from a labour point of view as well, I think trying asking asking our already beef or a beef be a beef dairy tillage farmer to try to operate this would would be I don't think it would be sustainable from a labour point of view. But we want to answer yeah. those questions going forward in the in the project. Sorry, Gavin, we're, we're I guess we always hear that every blade of grass is competed for in in West Cork. So it it just strikes me as 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 curious, you know, in an area where there's such intense demand for for land, um, and it's all farmed very well. That um, you know you're you're introducing this this bio refinery. I, I I understand you know the 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 theory behind it, but you know will, will there be will there be an intense comp um, even more intense competition for land? Just curious. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's important to note, Tom, with, with this unit, it's going to be this is an R and D very very small scale unit, so it, there's not going to be okay. massive. We're not going to be putting a lot of acres into this, so there's not going to be a massive demand. It's just important to note that. Um, but it was. Going forward, and I think that's probably the, the challenge with with um with, with AD as well. I suppose where, where is all this extra biomass going to go from? Well, I know there was some analysis done in the region um that you'll be looking at the um potential of of beef farms in actually or other dairy or other farms that aren't at the higher rate of productivity that they could actually be increased and looking at that extra grass produced on on those farms. So I think mm -hmm. potentially, definitely, um that's a concern. But I think maybe the grass boy refinery comes in into this um, a bit more instead of putting it straight into AD, could you potentially yeah. put into grass boy refinery and still have some of the outputs out, um, from the grass and the press kick? So, okay. yeah, but okay. similar similar um, object, I suppose, concerns around the, the AD piece, I would say. Um, okay, Eddie, have you one very, we've, we've two minutes yeah, left. Have you one yeah, very I, short I, question and I'll, and I'll ask uh, Gavin for a short, a, a short answer then. So, yeah. Well, well, I have a comment and a short question and then, and then I'll be very quick just to say that a lot of questions have, have come in since we started asking questions. And I'd say by far the biggest topic that has been asked about is biodiversity. So it kind of indicates the interest of the audience that is listening in this morning. Um, mm -hmm. and th that's just a comment on, on a question. One of the measures you put in for carbon sequestration, and it ties in, there's a good few questions on clover and multi-species. Do you, I'm wondering how persistent the multi-species is, and do you envisage a case where reseeding of multi-species swords may well negate or remove uh, the benefits on, of carbon sequestration that, that, that uh, may be assigned to it as a measure to improve carbon sequestration? Just a short answer, as we said, the, the persistency, what we're seeing is after two or three years, the spores that are um, sown in um, 2020, that the herbs don't don't last in the persistency, but we're seeing a benefit to them. And what we have now in that paddock, I'm thinking paddock 16, and Kevin had given me some figures previously that actually grew a phenomenal amount of grass with, with no chemical nitrogen last year, it grew above the average. So persistency is an issue, but can we get the benefit? Is there ways, and I think we're, we're all learning how to manage these and, and increase the persistency, um, but I think it's a good... Oversowing, not sure how successful that's going to be in the future, but mm. it's something we might be able to try. Yeah, I, I think I always said, I, I always felt like clover and grass is a multi species. You have two species there, okay, that there's less, but it's still a multiple of one. Yeah, <laughs> and, it's, the, the, it's the, the, and there the, may the, well be benefits even if the other herbs have died out. Mm, um, mm, doesn't yeah, mean it's yeah, not, the bene not benefits might have accrued in the first three years, uh, perhaps, you know, and and, yeah. and and they could last for other years. I'm Tom, I leave it there, yeah. I'm going to have to call it at that, unfortunately, Eddie um, and Gavin. It's it's been really, really um, enjoyable for me to listen to your presentation, Gavin, and uh, to uh, have a chance to put some questions to you along with my colleague Eddie uh, following your presentation.
So look, for, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Gavin for uh, taking the time to um, pull together that presentation. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that wasn't, uh, that wasn't done in, in a matter of minutes. It, it probably took uh, at some time. So we, we, we in Chagas appreciate that and, and our, our colleagues here in the uh, sustainability, uh, signpost uh, sustainability series, Dairy Sustainability Ireland, National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. So thanks Gavin and thanks to my colleague Eddie uh, as well for his help with questions. Just to let you know that next Friday, we will be joined by Barry Caslin, Energy and Rural Development Specialist at Chagas. Uh, and Barry will talk with you next week about sustainable energy options in agriculture. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I hope you have a great weekend and uh, continue to enjoy the fine weather. Uh, thank you. And finally, thank you to our production team of Yvonne Marr and Andy Bowling.